welcome Hoosier fans to this week's edition of Banner Monday, where we begin the week the best way that we know how, and that is by talking Indiana basketball and Big Ten hoops. I'm your host, Jared Morris, back for my first Banner Monday in a while. My thanks to Coach and to Andy for holding things down while I could not be here. Uh, a couple quick housekeeping notes off the top. As always, keep supporting our friends at homefieldapparel.com. You can use that promo code ASSEMBLY20 at any time to get 20% off. Now, they often have some other deals going that if you're following them on Twitter, you might see, but that Assembly 2-0 code will always take care of you with 20% off. And if you haven't checked, they now have sweatpants made out of that bison uh, sweatshirt hoodie material. They're on, I haven't worn them yet, but they look unbelievable. So that certainly is worth checking out. And then if you want to support your local food bank, make sure that you go to foodpantries.org or feedingamerica.org where you will be able to find food banks in your area and how you can support them. So that's foodpantries.org or feedingamerica.org. All right. And now I'm pleased to welcome in from the Big Ten Network, from the Sporting News and Fox, one of the hardest working men in college hoops, even when there are no college hoops to cover, is the venerable Mike DeCourcy. Mike, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Jared? And that, 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 the playing of that uh, little jingle there <laughs> takes on a different meaning after the last two months, or last uh, month, I guess it's been. Doesn't it? I was thinking that, too, when I was getting set up. Have we done a show since, have you and I done a show no. since the last dance was on? I don't think so. Okay. So, yeah, it does, it does take on a little bit more meaning now. Well, we'll I, I do want to talk to you about that at the end. So let's hold that thought, because I do want to get some last dance thoughts, since obviously that ended uh, last night. But... We actually had some big news in the world of Big Ten basketball and Indiana basketball today. I mean, it's really more of a confirmation of what we expected to happen than any kind of breaking news. But Christian Lander uh, is officially reclassifying to the class of 2020. He sent in his LOI. Indiana sent out press releases. They're tweeting. So this is an official uh, thing that is happening now. And, you know, people who do preseason rankings, whether it's Gary Parish in his top 25 and one, he bumped Indiana up six spots to number 21. Uh, Bart Torvik's T rank, uh, you know, when he put in all the numbers that he projects from Christian Lander, Indiana went from 17 to 12. Uh, you know, and I say that because that seems to be, I guess, about the consensus. This bumps Indiana up about five or six spots. Uh, what are your thoughts on what Christian Lander's impact can be next year for Indiana? I think the first thing is to be. I, I think to be fair to Christian, um, he we don't know like if this were an ordinary circumstance. Once Christian had his high school diploma in hand, he would like it would like be in a drive-through window, not because of COVID, but because you know he's got to get to Bloomington. So boom, grab the diploma and go and get to Bloomington and start strength training at the college level you know, trying to grow a young body into a division one body would be the first order of business. And I'm not saying that he's not in great shape, but for a high school kid, he's in great shape, but it's a different deal when you go to college and, and he's a year younger than most college freshmen are. This isn't a young man who, uh, based on what I gathered from listening to and reading Brian Snow, it's not a young man who um, was, was delayed in entering school or held back or anything like that. I mean, he's a typical high school age junior who's now going to skip his senior year and go straight to college. So you have to, you know, you have to give him a little bit of an allowance in terms of expectation for how, you know, how ready he'll be to handle the physical pounding of playing 35 division one games. So I, 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 but from a talent standpoint, he's a lot of what Indiana needs is really has great ball handling ability is an excellent, uh, he, he, he still has ways to go with his accuracy. Some of that I think is the product of being the guy that ever, that they need to take the most shots because accuracy will, should go up playing in a college system with a top flight point guard and an elite big guy. I think his accuracy should go up because I think the quality of his shots will go up. But we're, but from a variety, from the ability to shoot from a variety of circumstances, aren't, you're not going to find many college guys coming in who can shoot three more different ways: step back, um, you know, feint and and pull back, uh, the you know, off the catch, straight off the bounce, 
all those circumstances. His shot's a little low. Um, that doesn't bother me because he showed that he knows where you know he knows where the defender's going to be and how to disarm the defender. He's he's shown that he's learned that. Now it'll be more difficult to do that to college defenders than it was to high school defenders or AAU defenders. But he he understands that. I don't think the 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 release of his shot being a little bit low is going to be a problem for him. I think he he has he has he has gained an understanding of of how that works for him and how to make that work for him. So left goes right. Just so many different ways that he can get a shot off, and that's what to me is the most exciting thing because you know when I've watched his tape now. I see a guy who's really comfortable with a scorer's mentality. And see, so how do you accommodate two point guards, two guys who need to have the ball in their hands? Um, well, if one, the first thing is you need, you need one of those two guys to be really comfortable scoring. Because if they're not, if they're two guys who want to just set up all the time, they, they step on each other. They, they, they become uh, redundant. And, and I think that that can be a problem, but I think, Having Robert with the with the leader and and set up and and make shots mentality and another guy who can be a pure scorer because that's the role you need him to fill, uh, I think that can work very well. Yeah, Rob's actually been a very effective off ball shooter uh, in his time at Indiana. It's actually been one of the things he's been most consistent with offensively. So it'll be obviously those guys will get some time together next year, and it'll be interesting to see how they function. You know, I'm curious in terms of what you expect from Christian Lander next year. I know it's really difficult to project those things, especially with just how odd this off season is, which you alluded to. I mean, not the normal weight training, not the normal time with the team, all of that stuff. You know, one benefit is he has played AAU with some of the guys that are on Indiana's team, so that will at least help. But to kind of provide a frame of reference, I want to think back to DJ Carton's freshman year last year at Ohio State. Now, it's it's different. He was a senior coming in, but he was ranked I think a little bit lower than where Christian was. Christian, I think, slotted in at number 24 in the final 24-7 rankings for this class. You know, DJ Carton was 30 or 35 last year, a high four-star prospect. But if you look at what he did before he left the team, there were some spectacular moments, you know, some rough moments, like when he turned the ball over seven times in Bloomington. But I think all told, through the games he played, he averaged about 10 points a game. He was playing roughly 24 minutes a game, about three assists, and about two and a half turnovers. If I put the over-under for Christian Lander at about 80% of that, just given that he's a year younger, um, what would you what would you take? Well, I would say over. And I, I think the, the main the main factor in the over and under on Christian Lander versus DJ Carton is the over in games played. I think well, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the one you want. Because um, we didn't get to see how DJ Carton would have been later in the year when a guy like that you would expect to be playing his best ball. So Yeah, I, I, I think... Uh, you know, I, I think the, the key for uh, Christian is, like I said, be physically ready. I, I think that you won't see, you know, uh, you, 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 you don't go in expecting to see the variance. Because the, DJ Carden did not struggle because his game wasn't good enough for the Division One level to be good night after night. I mean, he obviously had other concerns that kept him from being the player that he should have been. I mean, you watch the Kentucky game. And you're not expecting him to be that every night. But there were nights when he was the inverse of that. And that's not typical. I mean, guys have bad nights, but they don't go from that to being, like you said, the seven turnovers and to being really, uh, to, to, to really struggling. And, and so you, 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 you would expect that uh, Christian would be able to come in and, and be – reasonably consistent. And again, I think that, I think that the role definition will be different that what, what Ohio state did was alternate their point guards. And I don't think that Indiana has the personnel necessarily to think, think that first, I think the first thing they need to think is how do we play these two guys together? That's my first thought is that, 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 that will be their best team when, when those two players are playing together. So how do you play them together? And again, I think that, the, the way to make that happen is for Christian to be the guy that you want to be your perimeter scorer. Uh, you, you did that with Devonte green a year ago. I, I like the idea, honestly, of having a player who, who you can build with and try to build the mentality 
the scorer's mentality within the framework that you want. I think Devontae's mentality was already pretty settled by the time that the, the new coaching staff got to him. And so now you get a chance to start over with a player who can do a lot of the same things uh, physically uh, and skill-wise that Devontae could, but that maybe will do them more within your framework. So with Christian Lander being added to this year's recruiting class in the final 24-7 class rankings, Indiana was second in the Big Ten. Basically, it was Michigan overall, Michigan 12th, Indiana 13th, Illinois 14th. So kind of a grouping right there of the top three in the conference. And with Lander being, I think, whatever I said, 24th or 27th overall, this now marks the third straight year that Indiana is enrolling the highest rated recruit in the Big Ten under Archie Miller, going back to Romeo Langford two years ago, Trace Jackson Davis last year, and now Christian Lander what does that mean to you? Like, is that obviously that's good for Indiana to have done it? Although you would like to see maybe more results with those, but we didn't get to see what they would have done in the tournament last year. But what does that say about Indiana's recruiting, or inversely, what does it say about Big Ten recruiting? Well, I think the first thing that it's important is that when you mentioned those three recruits, all three of them were Indiana kids, and when Tom Crean left the IU program, one of the principal complaints from IU fans about that regime was that too many top Indiana players were departing for other states, other schools. Uh, you had, it, it, we could sit here and name a half dozen of them without even thinking. And that was, that was considered to be a significant concern about the way the program was operating. And they will, there, a large number of people said, you know, why is Chris Wilkes going 3,000 miles to college? Why is Trevon Blewett going to, you know, 200 miles to college? You know, why aren't more of those guys playing in the state of Indiana for IU? Why is Gary Harris going from my neighborhood here, you know, up to Michigan State and Zach Irvin from the same neighborhood up to Mich- Michigan? And all those sorts of things combined to, to, to make some, IU fans uncomfortable. And now for the third consecutive year, you have the best player in the state and one of the best players in the country choosing IU. That, you know, that's a part of what you want IU basketball to be. It's not all of it, but you have to have that start in order to keep it moving. You can't, you know, if there's no car, the car can't move. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that, you know, I don't think that's been given enough appreciation by the, the by the fan base that has been, you know, it's not happening fast enough. It, you know, we want better results. I, I don't think there's been enough appreciation for that as, you know, for that being part of what has been successful. It, it, you know, and he's not the only one from this state, from this class that's enrolling at IU that are top, you know, high school basketball products. He's, he's probably the only one that would be, you know, at, at the, you know, McDonald's all America level, if he'd been around for that, but he's, he's one, of, you know, he's another really high end uh, prospect from the state of Indiana that's choosing IU. So that's, I think that's really important. And in, in more than best in the big 10 or whatever, I think, the fact that those guys are Indiana players playing in Indiana is not given enough credence by a lot of people who say that was important to them. In your uh, kind of ongoing top of your head, Big Ten power rankings here in the middle of the offseason as you know stuff changes and ebbs and flows, does this move the needle for you? Like, does this move Indiana up, you know, into a definitive new spot in your mind? Well, you know, in my mind, I kind of was thinking that he was going to be there all along. I mean, uh, like if I if I were doing what Gary is doing, uh, I would have probably already ranked under that presumption. Um, Gary Parrish, I, you mean? Yeah, yep. yeah. It's hard. It's hard to know where to put them until I know for certain, like who who's going to play at Indiana. I mean, excuse me, who's going to play at Illinois? Who's going to play at Iowa? Yeah. Who's going to play at Michigan State? Um, it's it's really hard. I you know I know what I expect. You know, I expect Luca Garza to be back with the Hawkeyes. Uh, I expect uh, um, I expect uh, Michigan State to probably go one and one, but I don't know. I mean, things happen. So, and I also don't know when the process is going to end now yeah. with 
with the date being pushed back, I don't, I don't know when anybody's going to know who's going to play in college next year and who's going to try their luck in the NBA. So I, I, you know, I think I had Indiana always as a borderline, you know, top, you know, basically a top 30 team somewhere in that range. And I, th- I think they still have some things to prove, especially at the defensive end before I'm comfortable saying they're a locked top 25 team. Did we learn anything this week that gives us more insider knowledge about whether we're going to have a college basketball season that begins on schedule? I mean, I think we're all at, some, at this point are kind of bracing for the very real possibility the games could be played without fans. But did we learn anything from some of the other sports or what the NCAA did that gives us any more insight on what the schedule might look like? I mean, I, I think that more schools than not are leaning toward – uh, enrolling their students on campus in the fall in some fashion. Now that doesn't mean maybe a hundred percent, but I think that it, it, it appears that's the way this is going. They all know what it would mean for them from, from a negative standpoint to not do that. And so absent a massive revival of the virus I think that that's that's the direction we're going to go. And I've always said, I've always maintained, if there are students on campus going to class, living in dorms, there are going to be football games and cross country meets and and whatever and soccer games, et cetera. And it, it there will be a question of in what form the audience will, will be, but I, I've never doubted that if the students are on campus that they're going to play there. It, it'd be so destructive to college athletics uh, in, in just about every school to not have a football season. Certainly not, certainly every high major school to not have a football season be so destructive that it, you know, it, in many ways, college athletics will, as we know them might not, you know, be able to endure. I mean, and when I say, as we know them, I mean like full fledged college athletic programs, we're going to have college football and basketball, women's basketball, probably women's volleyball. Um, we're going to have all those games, soccer, women's soccer. We'll have them for, you know, forever, you know, for as long as we're around. But the the uh, broad-based program, if we don't have a football season in the 2021, 2021, 2020, 2021 academic year, I think that I think that becomes a, a complete luxury. And so I, I, I know they all know that. So they're going to do everything they can to play it. And the idea of pushing it back just to push it back, be, and maybe it'll be safer then. I think that they understand that that it contains a whole another risk because if you push it back from the fall and then you get to the end of fall without any real incidents, so to speak, and then something happens in January, February, and then, it, you know, and then all of a sudden you can't play in the spring. I mean, the, you know, they can't afford that. So I think that it, I, I, I expect that, again, if so, unless something happens that that we aren't anticipating now, um, that there will be students on campus in most places and that there will be intercollegiate sports in all the places that don't have students. I that do have students. I, I, I don't know what the. We know the California state institutions, which San Diego State, Fresno State, Cal State Fullerton, schools like that, will not have on-campus students. We know that. We don't know what they'll do about that uh, athletics in that circumstance. They haven't decided. That's not the Pac-12. A lot of people might immediately assume Cal, UCLA, they're not involved in that. They have to make, you know, the, the University of California has to make its decisions about in, its campuses. I've had people tell me there's no way they're not doing what the Cal States do. I don't necessarily buy that. It, they'll do. I think they'll do whatever is prudent and whatever they're allowed to do by their government. We don't know yet what that will be. So I want to turn our attention now for the rest of the time that we have to talking about The Last Dance, which obviously ended last night. It just, I mean, just a great sports documentary. You know, flawed in many ways, you know, but just a lot of fun. And especially for those of us, you know, who were around when Michael Jordan was at his apex, to be able to go back and kind of relive those moments was was really enjoyable. And you wrote a column today that I, I feel like was written 
to directly address the internal debate that I've been having with myself this morning since watching that last night. Because, you know, you watch the end of that Utah Jazz game and, you know, just how it, it felt like they were hanging on by a thread. I mean, Dennis Rodman's going out and wrestling in between games. Scotty's back is hurt. You know, Michael just has to do everything there at the end to win this game. And you're like, man, I mean, there is no way. It almost feels like they couldn't have won another game, you know, just the way that, that it felt. And yet then you see Michael at the end saying, heck, yeah, we wanted to come back and go for a seventh title. And, I've, you know, I've kind of been debating with myself, like, you know what? That was the perfect ending. It was only going to mess it up if they came back again. That was great. But it was Michael, <laughs> you know, and if you and the thing is, like, if you grew up then, I mean, I was what? you know, 11 through 16, 17, you know, as he's going through that, I mean, you really came to a point with Michael Jordan where you just believed he would come through no matter what every single time. And so it's hard when you put yourself back in that feeling to feel like if they came back that he wouldn't have found a way to do it. And yet logically, when you actually rationally look at it as you did, it seems very unlikely. So can you can you help settle? I, mean, I know what you're going to say, but maybe for other people who are, who are having the same internal debate as me, help add some rationality to it. Well, I think the first thing that you have to remember is that, you know, Michael could, could, could achieve a lot. And, and a lot, you know, that there was always the feeling like he could get anything done, but remember on the front end of his career, he was fantastic. I mean, he came out of the block averaging 30 plus points a game. So there was never any question that he was phenomenal from the word go. I remember the 63 point game that was in his second year. And that alone wasn't enough. I mean, the, the Celtics were still better. Now, there wasn't a Celtics of the 80s by the time, you know, not the 99 season came around. The, the Spurs, who were the eventual NBA champions, were a very, very good team. They would have been a 60-win team in a full NBA season. That was a strike-shortened season, which actually would have helped Michael and Scotty. But first of all, you would have had to get to take Scotty, who had played – the entirety of the dynasty years under a contract that was vastly undervaluing him. He signed it willingly. It wasn't, you know, but he wanted the long-term extension uh, because he wanted the security. But by the time he got to the end of it, the money had gotten so much bigger. And there was, I mean, that year, um, the year, the off season between the last dance and the Spurs championship year, that year, Matt Geiger, signed for $8 million a year, give or take. And so, I mean, what was Scottie Pippen worth in that atmosphere? Well, you have been asking him to come back for a figure that, what? Unless Michael was willing to completely eliminate his salary, he made 32, 33, something like that in the last dance year. He would have had to basically forfeit that. Was he willing to do that? He never said that. <laughs> he never said how to play for nothing. I mean, that would have, it would have probably taken that. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know whether that was even have been allowed. I mean, I'm not sure whether they would have al allowed to give him a pay cut like that. But let's just assume that he would take it. Well, they, okay, so now you have him and Scott. Um, then you have, on the other hand, the, the front court of Dennis Rodman and Luke Longley. You know, Dennis, the following year, after the Bulls waived him, uh, they nobody wanted him. Nobody. It, it, he sat there for a month. And then finally the, Lake, finally, the Lakers signed him. They, they offered him a million dollars for what was left of the season. It would have been about, I think it was around 40 games or maybe 35 by the time he signed. He lasted less than two months. They didn't want him anymore. I mean, and that was a team with championship ambition. And he was averaging, I think, 11 rebounds a game. But he was, he was completely incorrigible again. Kobe Bryant was quoted as saying he was constantly late. And Kobe was like in his second or third year, and he, even, he, he knew that. Dennis wasn't serious anymore. Would he have been with the Bulls? Maybe. Did he have any gas left in the tank? They didn't think he did. Uh, and, and he ended up playing, I think, 23 games that year and 12 the following year, and that was it. Uh, he was done. Uh, Longley went to Phoenix. Uh, they traded, and they and actually got the Ron Artest out of the deal. Artest was the draft pick that they got. He, he, the, the number draft pick was around 15 or 16 and whatever draft it was. And they got our test out of it. So it was a pretty good deal on the other end. And Longley went down to Phoenix and wasn't even in their rotation when they went in the playoffs. I mean, he was, well, I shouldn't say he wasn't in the rotation. He wasn't at the front of their rotation. He averaged, I think 
16 minutes a game in a, in a three game playoff sweep that they lost. So not, you know, just not much there. So you're asking Michael and Scotty to basically win it on their own. And they look, they were phenomenal together. And the other thing, I mean, Scotty, even if he had taken the money, uh, you know, if he, if they'd given him the money to stay and he'd taken it, Scotty declined as well. I mean, Scotty never had another year like the last dance year. He was never a great player again. He was still a very good player most of the time, but he was never great again. And I don't know how much of that was physical and how much of that was circumstantial, but he was not. And he, it, Steve Kerr, who had been a great player, uh, a very significant player on the, the last three championship teams, his, he went to San Antonio and they were the team that won the title. Barely a rotation player in that, in that title year for San Antonio. Uh, hardly got off the bench in the playoffs. In the, in the, it, so when you look at all that, I mean, the, the time was up. And they didn't have salary cap money because of MJ and presumably Scotty to go out and chase free agents. And there just wasn't enough in the system at that point. Now, do I think that Krauss made a mistake? You know, I think that yes and no, because I think in forcing out Jackson and Jackson wanted to leave if, unless they were going to be a championship contender. That that's that's a truth. But I think he, they they went away. They went about it in the wrong way. And also in deciding that you know that. Rather than give your business, you're looking at this from a pure sports perspective. That's the way Jerry saw it. Okay. I'm looking strictly between the lines and you're in the entertainment business. You can't tell your customers, sorry, it's over. The, the, the league has to tell you it's over. The competition has to tell you it's over. And I understand there are business considerations to that, but they, they, all of that has to be, it has to be competition driven. It can't strictly be a dollars and cents thing. You can't put yourself in a deep hole, giving Scotty another long-term contract, you know, now this time for real money, but you can give him a, you know, a couple of years uh, at a, at a high salary figure and keep him around as you transition to your rebuild. You can't tell me Scotty Pippen isn't somebody that you want in a rebuild. And you can't tell me that. I mean, too much of a high character player, uh, too much of a winner, a great defender. He's uh, that's always going to stay with him. You have him and Ku coach and Michael. Maybe you know, and maybe you pull off a miracle. So, all, from the standpoint of basketball, Kraus was right. They probably weren't going to win it again, and it and it probably and from from a standpoint of money, Reinsdorf was probably right it was going to cost them more to try to pull it off than it was going to be worth. But from the standpoint of customer relations, they were both egregiously wrong. You have to give those guys another lap if they want. Now, if they come to you and say, look, you know, we, we, we got, we, we're done. You know, the, if Michael had said, I don't have any gas left in the tank, I'm out of here then that would be a different story. But clearly that was never Mike's intent. He never, he, his, his intention was not to retire after 98. He did it because he felt forced to. I still think if you're Michael Jordan, you can force them to deal with you more so. I, I think he made it too easy on them by saying, if Phil's not here, I'm not here. I think he should have said, no, I want to come back. And, if, and you're, you're going to have to cut me. I think that's what he should have said. Hmm. Was the experience of watching this just an entertaining trip down memory lane for you, or did you did you learn something from watching it? I, I'm not sure. You know, I, I think I was. I think I, you know, at that in that period, I was um, I was covering college basketball on a 365 day basis. Then that was when I, you know, I was working in Cincinnati uh, and doing sporting news on the side. So I watched a lot of, uh, of those games certainly watch the finals, but I didn't watch it as, you know, I, I was involved in draft coverage and this and that. So I probably didn't watch it, you know, every play or whatever. Um, so, you know, I would say that it, it showed me things that I didn't remember seeing um, that I didn't remember. I mean, obviously once you got to the finals, I probably saw most of that. 
and and remembered that. So it was it was you know it was interesting to see Michael do the things that he did and know that in any era he would have been incredible. I mean, I have I you know I I've, I'm sure you've seen on Twitter from time to time people saying uh, he wouldn't have been that good in you know in this era you know uh, because you know they they you know they play defense differently now and. It, but I mean, Michael would, was just amazing. I mean, just an absolute artist. And, you know, I feel privileged to have seen him the handful of times that I did. And I don't resent him, by the way, for the time that my, my wife had always wanted to see him play. So the last game of, I think it was 91. I think it was 91. I don't think it was 92. I think it was 91. One of those two years, I, either 91 or 92, uh, they played at Cleveland. I picked up my wife like five o'clock on the dot from her job. We drove to Richfield Coliseum. I think we, I think we stopped at a McDonald's drive through get there or pulling into the parking lot at seven 30. I don't remember what I think. I think it was around seven 25 and the tip was at like seven 35 or something like that. And when we pull into the parking lot and have the cab station on, they announced that MJ not only is not playing, because the cat, the the bulls have already clinched whatever there is to clinch. He's not even in the building. Oh, geez. So all that, and he wasn't <laughs> even there. So I'm not bitter about that. He he was an amazing player to watch, and like I said, I feel privileged to have been able to see him as much as I did. And of course, the greatest. Well, I mean, actually, there were a few you know Indiana related moments in the duck because there was a lot of Isaiah Thomas in there, but that wasn't always positive <laughs> for Isaiah. But the, you know the the part that that really stuck with Indiana fans is when they showed Bob Knight after coaching Michael Jordan in the nineteen eighty four Olympics. This was before he had played in the NBA, and Bob Knight said he was the greatest basketball player that he had ever seen, which was I remember that. pretty pretty incredible foresight from a guy who obviously knew talent. I do remember that, and I remember and I remember at the time, like I think every like if you asked anyone who followed basketball then, especially with the way the game was played. I think everyone understood why Houston took Hakeem, even though they already had Ralph. I think everyone understood it. He was a he was an incredible big man, and the big men ruled the game then. But Portland taking uh, Bowie, everybody knew that was a bad pick. Not just because Michael was there, which was a huge part of it, but also because I mean the guy had missed two college seasons. I mean everybody knew it. Like how Portland ever thought that was a good idea. Like if there was nobody else that could play, like I get like if you'd taken the number two pick in this draft and you got a shot at Sam Bowie, I might roll the dice. The, the 2020 draft, I might even take 52 year old Sam Bowie or whatever he is, <laughs> the 58 year old. But uh, but man, I mean, passing up Mike to take a guy who had his in, injury issues, no, no, I mean, no one in America thought that was a smart move then. No. Well, Mike, we always appreciate you coming on with us, lending your insight. I was glad to be back for this one, and uh, we'll look forward to continuing to do this throughout the offseason. Sounds great, Jared. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mike. The great Mike DeCourcy join us here on Banner Monday, as he always does. Fun conversation with Mike. Uh, we will have another episode of Assembly Call Radio, as we always do, coming up on Thursday. Hope you'll join us for that. Hmm. I wonder what the Banner moment might be. Yeah, I think I have a pretty good idea uh, <laughs> what it might be. Uh, after, I'm, although I will say, if something can rival Christian Landers' reclassification becoming official, uh, then that would mean it would be a pretty good week uh, for Indiana basketball. But we'll talk about that. Uh, talk about some other stuff. Haven't figured out a good topic. By the way, if you have off-season topics that you want us to address, always let me know. Obviously, if you're in the community, uh, assemblycall.com slash community, you can let us know in there. But email me, jared at assemblycall.com. Uh, or send me a tweet. Well, obviously, we'll start doing our player by player, uh, you know, off season breakdown that we always do. Um, but if there's anything else that you think would be fun for us to uh, to tackle, let me know. All right, thanks for being here live. If you're watching live, thanks for listening on the podcast, and we will talk to you on Thursday night. See you, everybody.